But in the last few videos, we've been testing other people's stuff, reviewing things, experimenting, digging deeper on other people's projects. But in this video, we are gonna invent something. All right, so I've been thinking about this topic for some time. What is the next generation of the duty handgun, the fighting handgun, actual handguns going to be? What are the trends that new designs are going to capitalize on? What are the old designs that are gonna be rejuvenated by new manufacturing technologies? Uh, this is fascinating for me to think about, and it's something that T-Rex Arms is actually really well suited uh, to experiment with. Not only do we have a factory full of really cool machining tools, uh, and we have a great SLS printer, uh, we have an FFL with the ATF, and we are registered as a manufacturer, so we can do all this stuff legally and above board. And then in the armory, we have classic historical firearms, and we have modern firearms. We have a bunch of different things that would be good to look at, take apart, and explore. But we can't do any of that on YouTube, thanks to new rules that uh, go into effect on the 18th of June. We can't do any of that stuff. Let me read uh, these things to you. So the, there's, there's new rules because people are freaking out about ghost guns. Not a lot of people, just a few prominent lawmaker type people. They've been complaining to YouTube. And so the new rules say that content showing the use of homemade firearms, automatic firearms, and certain firearm accessories will be age restricted, which is, Technically fine for us because uh, our demographics are older, older folks. I think my kids are the only kids that watch this channel. But the next bullet point says content intended to sell firearms, instruct viewers on how to make firearms or ammunition or certain accessories or instruct viewers on how to install those accessories is not allowed on YouTube, period. That means that content will be taken down and channels will be uh, kicked completely off of the platform. Uh, the last time that YouTube beefed up their firearm restrictions on YouTube was last year, I think it was around February, and a ton of content got taken off of the channels, specifically stuff related to firearm accessories like suppressors, and just showing those being attached to the firearm initially got a ton of stuff taken down, even stuff like uh, Forgotten Weapons content, which has tons and tons of views. It's specifically showing historical artifacts that are not available for sale anywhere got taken down off of the channel just because of the way that they were interpreting some of these rules. Now, actually YouTube backtracked and brought some of that historical content back, stuff that had been up for years or decades, but this is part of the issue. This is a super vague, super vague thing. Uh, even though it says some accessories, and it doesn't describe what those are, certain accessories without describing what those are, it then says, please know this is not a complete list. So this already vague description is not all encompassing. There could be other things that get you kicked off that they haven't explained. So here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna get all the cool guns out of the armory. We're not gonna make prototypes. We're not gonna do any ergonomic testing. We're just gonna talk about the 3D models that we're creating for video game purposes. Let's get to it. So this right here is obviously not uh, a handgun. It's not even a pistol as defined by the ATF because that is clearly a stock and not a brace. It can be hard to tell, but for the YouTube reviewers out there, this is, uh, this is a rifle. Now, the reason I wanna start off here is because rifles have a lot of time behind them. This AR-15 platform is now extremely old. It's even older than I am. And the future of rifles is supposed to be something slightly different. For many years now, we've been told that the future of rifles is gonna be bullpups. And we've made a lot of different bullpups over the years, which have been different levels of successful. They've all had uh, advantages, but they've all had issues. Now, I actually think that bullpups are gonna kind of make more sense in the future based on more stuff that goes on rifles. In the past, this was the rifle that you would fight with. Probably a sling, maybe an optic, but today rifles get tons and tons of stuff on them and carbines as well. You got your laser illuminators and your laser targeting devices and you get your regular flashlights and illuminators and wires and push pads and switches for all of those things. Plus not just one optic, sometimes two or maybe even three. And as long range stuff gets packed into smaller and smaller ballistic computers, we're gonna have ballistic computers attached to rifles and more complicated optics and firing control computers. So all that stuff 
generally lives up here and it starts to make this thing front heavy. So a lot of people have talked about the ergonomics of bullpups in the past and I think they're gonna keep talking about them into the future. When you take all the operational stuff, all the mechanics of the gun that happened in front of the firing hand and you move it back here, all of a sudden this thing is gonna balance a little bit better and you get the longer barrel. So on paper, I love bullpups. I think that they are smart. I think that they are fantastic. And the more stuff that you add to the rifle in the future and the bigger bullets that you wanna shoot and the farther that you wanna shoot because your ballistic computers allow you to do that, the more sense they make. Unfortunately, I just don't like them in person. They have uh, some significant issues from an ergonomic perspective. Even though they balance better, now your entire manual of arms is happening down here. You can't operate up here in your workspace. You gotta get under your armpit here, and that's kind of an issue. Uh, the Steyr is probably my favorite uh, of all of the bullpups that I have used. Uh, there are newer bullpups that try to fix certain things. Um, Desert Tech, and Keltec have some interesting ones. I'm sure other companies with tech in the name are gonna figure some stuff out. In addition to your manual of arms all happening back here behind this hand, uh, there's a lot of explosive stuff happening right here underneath your nose. If stuff goes wrong with the rifle, uh, bits and pieces of it go into your jugular or carotid artery. So that's kind of a downside. And Obviously, there are ways that you can shield things. There's ways that you can, uh, in the same way that the trigger is moved up here with this, uh, this long connecting bar, you can move some of your other controls, some of your magazine releases and bolt releases up to the front. But every time you do that, you add some complexity to the whole system, which is where I wanna start talking about handguns. Now, hopefully you've watched a video that we made uh, several months ago about the history and future of Glock. The Glock handgun completely and totally changed the handgun game in terms of materials and manufacturing technology and in the striker fired double stack polymer framed injection molded thing that it is. But it retained some pretty old pieces of technology, notably the Browning tilt barrel action. This right here is that Browning tilt action barrel. It's a terrible animation, so don't pay too much attention to it, but this is what happens when uh, the slide cycles, it unlocks from there and it tilts up and it's just a fantastic design. It gives you the accuracy of a locking barrel, it absorbs a whole bunch of the recoil in its actual physical motion and it's just a fantastic way to shoot decent sized uh, bullets and high powered projectiles. And it's about a hundred years old. There's a bunch of other ways that you can uh, cycle a semi-automatic weapon in pistol sized form and this one is just kind of the best, but everything is a compromise. So this is the best for some of the stuff that we're doing now, but there are certain trends inside of the gun industry, inside of modern technology, that possibly change this equation just a little bit and make some of the other compromises superior for certain things. So. We have some new manufacturing technologies now. Uh, suppressors are easier to come by, uh, even though the ATF still restricts them pretty heavily. Uh, but the biggest change in the last few decades is red dots on pistols. Having an optic on a pistol is a huge deal, and almost every major pistol manufacturer has realized this, and almost all the pistols that they make do come optic ready. But all that means is that there is a little bit cut out here on the slide. All that that means is it's pre-drilled. You're still mounting that optic on something that moves back and forth at really high speeds. And the optic manufacturers have compensated for this by building optics that are small, pretty low weight, uh, and rugged so that they can handle this back and forth, very punishing recoil management system. But if you have fired a rifle, or if you've used uh, small pistol caliber carbines, or even pistols that allow you to mount that red dot in such a way that it does not move back and forth between every shot, you know that that's pretty neat. It's a pretty good advantage to people uh, like myself. Not a decent shooter, not the best at recoil control. Having a non-reciprocating red dot 
improves my shooting quite a bit. Now, non-reciprocating red dots are actually where everything started. There were claw mounts and things like the six second mount that enabled you to put big red dots on pistols that didn't move, but they were difficult to holster. They were difficult to conceal. And as manufacturers made smaller optics and they could handle the abuse of being attached directly to the slide, we kind of got away from that. But again, everything is a compromise. So let's say we wanted to design a brand new handgun around some of these modern trends. What is it that we would come up with? So this is a design that I've been tinkering with for a little while, mostly in my head. I started building this a few days ago. And again, this is for video game purposes only. This is Lightwave 3D. This is a mesh. This is not for any purposes other than pure entertainment value. And uh, I have built this firearm around some specific things that I believe are important trends. So if you uh, look at the top of the gun right here, uh, you can see that there is a little cap right here and we're just gonna lift that off to reveal mounting points for an optic. And this looks like a weird place to put an optic, but it's kind of a compromise. We should talk now about the action of this particular pistol. Fixed frame barrels are a thing that have very little value once you get up to nine millimeter cartridges, anything bigger than like rimfire, but they have a huge amount of value for accuracy. Now, handguns don't need a whole lot more accuracy than, you know, the shooter who is shooting them. And uh, gas power designs are pretty cool as well for managing that recoil and chambering that round, but they, they retain a lot of heat. So the Laugo Alien, the h &K P7, they use very complicated but very cool gas-powered systems for recoil management and unlocking the action. But yeah, yeah they're kind of expensive, they're kind of finicky, and uh, it's difficult to switch those between suppressed and unsuppressed versions because the amount of gas that you have blowing the system back uh, changes. This right here that I have designed is a rotary barrel system. As the action cycles, the pistol is going to rotate. And this is not uh, an invention of my own, and this is actually nothing new. This is exactly uh, what a lot of people have been tinkering with for, again, you know, about a century. If you look at the internals here, as the gun fires and cycles, the barrel rotates. It moves back slightly along with this locking block, but instead of tilting, it rotates as the bullet comes out. And yes, Bullets come out looking exactly like that, YouTube. Just for reference, that is how that works. Now this has a couple of interesting features to it. Because the barrel is not tilting anymore, uh, we can get possibly a little bit more accuracy. We can retain uh, the axis of the barrel a little bit better, but also we can do suppression a little bit better. Uh, on a Browning tilt action barrel, uh, you have to have a spring-loaded booster to hold the the can, the suppressor, the silencer, all the things that that thing is called, so that the weight of it doesn't stop the weapon from cycling. And if you've ever shot handguns without boosters, like 22 caliber pistols or things that do have fixed barrels, it is so much nicer than running the extra weight and the extra mechanical clunkiness of that booster. Now, rotational barrels have uh, some issues with suppressors as well, but there's ways to overcome that, and so we're going with this. But the really interesting difference with this particular setup is the way that it's getting its ammunition out of the magazine. As the weapon cycles, these tongs grab around from the back of the magazine and lift it back up here. Again, this is a ridiculously simple animation that I made mostly today, so that's not exactly how it would work in real life. And this is an action that exists in real life. This is not my idea. This is an action that goes, again, way back, uh, over 100 years. If you look at belt-fed machine guns from World War I and afterwards, uh, the M1919 is a great example of this. It pulls the bullets backwards out of a cloth belt and then feeds them into the barrel. So this is a tried and tested mechanism for certain types of firearms. And it's been put into a pistol by a gentleman named Arnie Boberg. Again, we can't uh, get too deeply into how to manufacture firearms here, so this is a clip of a 3D video game on Steam called World of Guns Gun Disassembly, and it shows the action of the Boberg 
pulling that round from the back of the magazine and then lifting it up to insert it into the barrel. There's a couple of reasons why you would want to do this. One, it's just very cool and mechanically interesting. Uh, but the real reason is that it gives you another inch and a half to two inches of barrel length and it works pretty well with this rotating barrel system. Let's look at these pistols side by side. If I line them up uh, in exactly where they should be, you can see that the Glock is going to start loading from the breech face right here. This is the barrel length of the Glock. But we're able to start loading into the back of the barrel here on our Boberg style action. By pulling the rounds rearward, we get an extra inch and a half, or depending on how we set up the mechanism, maybe even more barrel length. And then I also do have a, a threaded barrel on the front here. So what we end up with with this pistol is something that is more like a Glock 34 length barrel in a Glock 19 sized package. Now this is not what Arnie Boberg was doing with his original design. He wanted to make a really tiny pistol and for various reasons, uh, he wasn't able to make it work as a business concern. Now, fortunately, Bond Arms picked up the Boberg XR9 and they are continuing to manufacture it as a gun that you can buy today and you can watch reviews of it today. And some of the best reviews of it are on that Forgotten Weapons channel with Ian McCollum and I recommend that you take a look at it. Now, the action is very cool. The mechanical mechanism is very cool, but it comes with some downsides. Again, everything is a compromise. And what the Boberg pistol is trying to do is take a medium-sized pistol and condense all of its mechanisms and all of its capabilities down into a small package. And it does a surprisingly good job of that with some downsides. The rotating barrel does a good job of absorbing some of the recoil. Uh, the various mechanisms, the bullet lifter and things like that, which are complicated and they add complexity and they add parts and they add costs, do have benefits. That extra barrel length and some recoil mitigation and so forth. But, in my opinion, the best thing to do with something of this level of complexity is not to build a super tiny pistol and put medium-sized pistol internals in it. I think that it would be better suited to take large pistol internals and bring it down into a medium-sized package. Having a larger and longer barrel is going to give you some more inertia. It's going to bring some of that recoil down even further and just help manage uh, the overall operation of the pistol a little bit better if you make it just a little bit larger. And ergonomically, medium-sized pistols are, are better to shoot. So the title of this video is The Future of the Fighting Handgun. If you are making a fighting handgun, if you are making a duty handgun, you want it to be a certain size. I'm actually really impressed with the SIG uh, P365 and the Glock uh, G3043 and the G48, uh, but there is a lot of downsides. We did a video on the main YouTube channel where uh, the guys put a huge amount of rounds through those tiny guns. And as good as they are, as good as they shoot, ergonomically they have some issues and they have some control issues as well. So what we're trying to build today is not the best pocket pistol, but something more like the best duty pistol, something that is robust and something that is going to do a little bit more for us than just be concealable. That being said, if you do go with this design, if you do load the pistol from the back of the magazine, if you get yourself an extra inch and a half of barrel length, you can put a pretty potent fighting capability into a pretty small package. I forgot to attach uh, the RMR here, but as you can see, uh, once we set this thing down on this fixed area here, we have a pretty good solid red dot that is not only stationary as the weapon fires, but it's out of the way. And part of the reason we can mount it so low is that this rotary barrel action also lets us lower the bore axis there. The closer the bore axis actually is to the web of your hand and the forearm bones, the better you can manage the recoil, the less barrel flip there is. This is something that is hotly contested on YouTube, so I hope you guys argue about it in the comments section. Uh, but it gives you some significant mechanical advantages, whether you are managing recoil or mounting a red dot in its lowest possible configuration. Let me move this Glock over here so that you can just see how much lower that bore axis is. 
If you can see the barrel axis here, and I accidentally dipped it down a little bit there, look at how much closer to that barrel axis you can get the web of your hand here. There is gonna be a lot better recoil mitigation, and we've got an overall smaller package here as well. Let's stick a light on this thing. The TLR7 is pretty good. That is a pretty small and capable package holding about the same round count as that Glock 19, but with considerably more barrel length. Now, you're probably wondering how important the barrel length is, and it sort of depends on who you ask. Um, fortunately, we have a test that has been done, and I'll throw the graph up here. As you have longer barrel length, you get significantly higher velocities from your rounds, up until a point. At some point, around 16 inches of barrel length, there's no longer enough power to actually continue accelerating the bullet and the friction of the barrel starts to slow it down. But the sweet spot seems to be around seven inches across a variety of different rounds. That is where the returns begin to diminish. And there's a lot of debate over what knockdown power actually is, what terminal ballistics actually are. But generally speaking, the faster that you can make the bullet go, the better. You get more consistent spin, you get more consistent expansion. It's just generally better bang for your buck. So yeah, we would like a little bit more barrel length, if at all possible. And even though there are some downsides to the mechanical complexity of this operation, the upsides are going to be power and that lower bore axis. Now, this looks a little weird and it's probably kind of hard to build a holster for it, but fortunately, I happen to know of a pretty good holster company. That is a fair amount of capability and a very small concealable inside the waistband holster and it offers a little bit more protection to that RMR uh, by mounting it lower down. So yeah, uh, the whole thing is extremely workable and uh, there's a lot of potential upsides to this if you can get around the mechanical complexity. That is a whole bunch of moving parts. And if you look at the proper animation of the Boberg properly cycling, you can see how many moving parts there are. However, sometimes manufacturing technology comes along and takes a design that wasn't fully viable and makes it more viable, or takes a viable design that wasn't very affordable and makes it more affordable and more reliable. A good example of this is the AR-15. When the AR-15 was new in the 1960s and the AK-47 was pretty robust and being manufactured well, they had a wildly different manufacturing cost. The AR-15 used a space-age technology called aluminum, and it had to be machined in very careful ways, whereas the AK-47 could be just stamped out by any old means of production that had been seized by the party, and labor was basically free in the Soviet Union. But over time, things have changed. Aluminum is much more cost-effective to produce, and right over there, we had a whole bunch of Haas machines that can just cut metal very precisely. Cheap CNC machines have made AR-15 lowers far faster and easier and cheaper to produce than those giant metal stamping factories, which kind of don't exist in large, uh, in large capacities anymore. So as time has changed and technology has changed, the costs have changed. And some of the manufacturing capabilities that were required to make really tightly fitting precision parts to make complex mechanisms work are simpler and easier to build at the moment. Move the slide out of the way. So this complicated stuff in here that the tongs that grab the gun, and then of course, the bullet lifter as well. That is some complicated stuff. And my hope is that modern technologies, possibly 3D printing, will make this simpler and more reliable. Um, if you were to 3D print a really complicated single piece mechanism, maybe out of titanium, maybe out of steel, it's possible that you could bring the cost down and the reliability up for this system. And uh, that would be really neat because there are, uh, it's not just that there's so many moving parts, but there are some things that are a little bit interesting about this design. Most handgun ammunition is designed to be loaded forwards into the breech of the barrel. And so we only need to crimp the case onto the bullet just enough to hold it while it is being shipped to your local stores, being shipped to your house, 
being loaded into the magazine and then fed forwards into the barrel. If you grab the case and pull it backwards very quickly, sometimes that heavy bullet gets left behind. The whole package comes apart and the propellant spills into the magazine full of other bullets. Which is why if you buy a Bowbird pistol, there is a list of acceptable ammunition, ammunition that has been crimped well enough that it will work. Uh, the Bond Arms version, I think, is a little bit slower and gentler in the way that it cycles because it allows you to use more ammunition, but there's definitely some downsides that you have to work around. Now, because we are designing the fighting handgun of the future, we could just say that that's going to be a design requirement for the ammunition itself. And because it's for the future, we could look at some different ammunitions. There's a bunch of different options. People have experimented with much smaller pistol bullets that get up to much higher velocities. This longer barrel would be really helpful if we wanted to go with something like uh, 4.7 or 5.7. Uh, 5.7 BRNO, is it Bruno? Is it Berno? Uh, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it, but there are a bunch of super high velocity, potentially armor piercing pistol caliber cartridges that would fit inside a handgun magazine uh, would benefit from this longer barrel and are unique enough that we could put the requirements of that really tight crimping in there and make it work. However, I'm kind of wanting this design to work off of regular 9mm because it's extremely common, it's extremely capable, and uh, it also gives us another cool capability. Let's, uh, let's throw a suppressor on here. Remember that that rotating barrel was uh, one of the advantages was going to be that it's easier to run certain types of suppressors on there without boosters and other mechanical devices. It's small, it's lightweight, it's straightforward. And small lightweight suppressors like this one uh, that use wipes instead of baffles are very cool. Now right now, there are legislative and regulatory hurdles to those because the ATF has decided that suppressors are very bad and dangerous and you go to prison for 10 years if you do the paperwork wrong. But if you have rubber wipes instead of metal baffles, you get some interesting performance benefits in really small spaces like this. The Gemtech Aurora 2 and some others are good examples of this. The only problem is if you have to get a $200 tax stamp for a suppressor and you have to wait in line and wait for your paperwork before you get one. You want something that's going to last for a long time. And the ATF has had different opinions about these rubber washers. But this is the fighting handgun of the future. Let's pretend we solve all of that in the future. You know, looking at this suppressor here, if I made that holster just a little tiny bit bigger, uh, you could carry that thing. You know, another cool thing about the low bore axis is you can have a one and a half inch diameter suppressor like that still easily see your sights over the top and through your lower red dot and extremely effective. Now, there's another interesting trend over the last few years that has popped up. Part of it is a regulatory thing. The ATF ruled that uh, pistol braces are not stocks. And so a whole bunch of really tiny short barreled uh, AR pistols and various other platforms got very small short shoulder braces on them. And they became really, really interesting for people to mess around with and do different drills with and experiment with and design products around. And there was kind of a resurgence the interest in PDWs, personal defense weapons. Uh, the Flux Raider is a great example of this and people have tinkered with these things for the last few years. Now the ATF did say that they were going to make pistol braces illegal again, but then the Supreme Court said that that uh, was outside of their level of regulatory authority. So you can have them once more. But one of the things that we can do with this particular fighting handgun platform is turn it into a PDW really easily. First thing we gotta do is uh, take off the optic. Should probably get rid of the light and the suppressor. And then this pistol shroud comes off like this. Remember, this is permanently attached. I haven't figured out how until you want to remove it. It is not a reciprocating part. And then all we have to do is swap this pistol grip and then let's put this particular grip on here. Now this gives us a couple of different things. Number one, an external safety, because I think that's important for something that's not gonna be in a holster. And uh, something that the Flux guys, I believe they're the first ones to invent this, place to hold a spare magazine up the front. Now let's grab a different, bigger shroud. This thing completely encapsulates the top of the slide here. 
And uh, one of the things that I forgot to show you guys, now on top of the slide here, there is a little groove that has been cut out. Uh, that isn't just for gutter snipe action. Uh, that is actually so when you grab a hold of this top shroud and drop it down, the charging handle drops right into that slide and allows you to run the whole slide back. And then a spring holds it up in place here so it doesn't move as you fire the weapon. So now we got an eight or nine inch barrel. We got about 30 rounds of ammunition and the ability to add a stock. We also have Picatinny rail up top here, which makes it really easy for us to add extra stuff. You can run larger optics and then anything else on that forward light rail. And of course we can run uh, bigger lights on the bottom with the full size light rail. So there's a bunch of stuff that you can do here. And I've been messing around with different ways of attaching and using the, uh, the pistol braces, which are once again, completely legal. Got cutie mounts right here. I'm not a huge fan of single point slings, but for something this tiny, it makes good sense. Uh, you got pick rail up here so that if you want to run bigger optics on bigger risers, they can stick out or little IR things. And then these ventilation holes, are of course, M lock, so you can add other stuff. So by only swapping out the shroud, the grip module and the barrel, we now have a completely different set of capabilities but it uses all the same parts. Uh, the other thing that gets you better accuracy, better repeatability, and better uh, affordability is mass production. So being able to make something that is a PDW or a pistol platform that share a lot of the same parts is a pretty useful thing. That's another thing that I think we're gonna see more in the future. There is a trend toward platforms over products that I find really encouraging and would like to see uh, anything that we design here on T-Rex Labs sort of fall into that category. Uh, just for comparison, let's check out our unbullpupped AR-15. You can see that there's a substantial size difference here. The PDW is a really compact package, bringing along with it the spare mag and lights and optics and so forth. It also would probably suppress really well. Now, if you're interested in PDW content, uh, the best channel to look up is probably Nine Hole Reviews. The guys have run over a bunch of past uh, and present PDWs and some of the trends and talked about where things might go in the future. So check them out and uh, bear in mind that they, Forgotten Weapons, and a bunch of other gun tubers are going to have some of the same problems that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. To talk about hypothetical video game weapons is still okay on YouTube, but other types of more rigorous technical content uh, isn't welcome. So if you are really interested in taking some of these designs and experimenting, I recommend that you start getting books on firearm design and manufacture. These by David S. Findlay are fantastic. Not only do these books have really good drawings of all the individual parts uh, of the firearms that they are about, but also just really good uh, math and equations and thoughts about firearm design part design, design for manufacture. Uh, each one of these is a fantastic study for you to go to. And yeah, you probably have to go to books like this because this kind of detailed technical information just isn't really uh, welcome on YouTube anymore. Fortunately, we're only talking about video game guns. And if you are curious about the Boberg design, go and research the new versions of it coming from Bond Arms. And this, uh, this mechanism, this sort of hybrid bullpup mechanism where you pull the rounds out of the back, I think also has a little bit of room for exploration in the rifle space. Uh, many, many years ago, CZ built a weapon called Beauty, or possibly Beautiful, depending on how you translate the original check. Uh, it was a personal defense weapon chambered in intermediate rifle cartridges, and it did the exact same thing. Because it pulled out of the rear of the magazine, the barrel could start here instead of here, giving you an extra five inches of barrel length in a much shorter package. Uh, it never actually made it to market, but that probably had more to do with specific regulatory concerns than physical restrictions. Actually, to be completely honest, the new YouTube rules made this video a lot easier because this kind of mock-up, this kind of purely artistic video game rendering is simple and easy. It only takes a couple of days to mess around with. 
the mechanical engineering side, building something that will or won't work to prove out these concepts is a lot trickier. But I want to encourage you guys to do both. Uh, even though it's not so friendly here on YouTube, that kind of maker mentality needs to be developed. You need to develop some of these skills. And the rest of you uh, who may not be into that maker space should probably start thinking about stuff that you can tinker with, even if they are only ideas at the moment, even if they are only video game designs. Be thinking about some of these ideas. Be becoming a person who will consider the sort of stuff that needs to be built in the future. You know, this thing's actually kinda, kinda growing on me. Like I started building it just to illustrate some concepts uh, and it does look a little bit like the Italian Spectre submachine gun, but I kinda want this thing to exist in real life now, not just, you know, video games. And for those of you who think this is a bad idea, I dare you, do the rest of the 99.9% .9 of the work to build out a prototype and prove me wrong.